Customer proximity is your magic potion. You lose that, you can become irrelevant pretty quickly. As the head of marketing for a company, you are serving a CEO typically that has amazing intuition and understanding of the customer. They expect you to also understand the customers and the market. Francois Dufour is a brilliant marketing leader and CMO coach for growth companies and startups. He also happened to be my coach when I ran marketing at Lattice. Francois really helped me transition from being an individual marketer to a true marketing executive in a fast growing company. I'm really excited for today's episode of Grow and Tell, the show where we tell the growth stories of revenue leaders behind successful companies. I'm your host, Alex Krakow. Francois started his career in product marketing at Yahoo back in 2004, where his big highlight was making Yahoo Messenger the number one IM service in the US. He then went on to lead LinkedIn talent solutions marketing efforts from 2008 to 2013, and he grew that business from a few million dollars in revenue to close to a billion, and then grew the marketing team from two to 50 people. Since then, he spent the last decade working as a marketing leader for many iconic Silicon Valley brands. He was the VP of global marketing at Twilio and helped them go public. He was the VP of marketing at Udacity and then held many advisory CMO positions for companies like Algolia, Apollo, GraphQL, and Versal. Now he's a marketing partner and resident CMO at Decibel and a CMO coach on the side. Francois and I caught up about early stage growth at LinkedIn and Twilio, the importance of getting close to customers, how to market and sell to a technical audience, and how to upgrade yourself from individual contributor to marketing leader. I hope you'll enjoy our chat. So I'd love to start the conversation with your time at LinkedIn. You joined LinkedIn in 2008 to run marketing for LinkedIn Talent Solutions. And from what I remember, it was a really fast-growing social network, but there wasn't much of a business model. I'd love to know like, what made you join LinkedIn, and can you kind of paint a picture of what LinkedIn was like when you joined? Yeah. Uh, so there was a business model, a very clear one, actually. And surprisingly, years later, when Reid Hoffman got awarded, a, I think, the Award of Entrepreneur of the Year by uh, HBS, they showed his uh, initial business plan. It was incredible how right he was. The only thing he got wrong is it was just a one year off. But he saw, so we, they were, they were four, uh, three business lines that were monetizing on top of the social network. But at the time when LinkedIn was 350 people, probably total revenue or bookings uh, AR of uh, uh, close to 90 million. And uh, the business lines were the premium accounts, the advertising business, and then the recruiting solutions business. And the first one, the larger one was the premium account. Oh, sorry, marketing solutions that we thought was going to be the largest business. And talent solutions that are recruiting solutions was the one I joined. Two and a half people marketing that, uh, about $20 million of AR, 10 sales reps. Uh, we thought was just going to be the, the smallest. It turns out that he accelerated. It was right on for recruiters and uh, we were at the right time at the, at the right place. Even though joining there in December 2008, I got really scared because that was right after the beginning of the financial crisis. And the first thing that gets cut is recruiting. The second thing that gets cut in marketing. And I, I thought, why did I just join? And luckily, when you have a disruptive service like this, which allows you to save money on other recruiting spend, that was right. Um, so very, very strong uh, and fast growing network and clear idea, but we needed, needed to build a lot of stuff. And so you joined, and it was just two and a half people, 20 million ARR. Like, what did those early days look like building it up from scratch? Like, you know, today everyone uses LinkedIn for recruiting, but when you joined, that wasn't quite the case. And so I'd love to, to know, like, how did you think about kind of positioning the product? How were you able to convince recruiters to actually use LinkedIn? Yeah. So uh, we didn't convince them to use LinkedIn. Our job was to convince them to use the LinkedIn premium services, recruiting services, because the network itself, through the word of mouth, through the network effects, was recruiting uh, recruiters who are creating their profiles. So the job was to figure out which organizations have recruiters there and really showing them why they needed our suite of solutions. And so the positioning was, uh, you need to go from, this is not a, a great way to put it, but to a glorified job poster, interview, resume screener, and interview scheduler to being a lot more strategic and do what we called and explained to be passive candidate recruiting. You build your brand, you source people, you source the right one, you put in job your jobs in front of the right ones, and you go from really being 
rely on luck and what was, what was called to spray and post uh, or post and spray and uh, and really become a strategic function. So we give them the tools, the data, and mostly the inspiration from the best, borrowing a lot from what the headhunting firms do and the internal search teams do to show them what's possible. Uh, and the suite of tools was increased and in better sourcing with what's called LinkedIn Recruiter, job post on the network, and solutions to help build your uh, employer brand reputation, company profiles and things like that. And so it sounds like there's a, a lot of like product marketing work to figure out, okay, what is the positioning? How do you think about like this pitch to, to the recruiters and like changing the way recruiters work from kind of, you know, just the, the posting or uh, job postings on the internet to actually having a more proactive approach to recruiting. But when it comes to, so I assume there's like a lot of education stuff you kind of put out into the market. But once you put out that education, was it mainly like inbound where people, recruiters just coming to you saying, oh, I'm interested and bought into that messaging? Or did you have to do more outbound and kind of go out to them and say, hey, recruiter, like you need to change the way you're doing you're doing things right now? We, we did both. So first with a network like that, and then when you have so many free or self-serve uh, premium recruiters, we wanted to make sure they could find our, we advertise on the network a little bit. We had some product integrations pointing them to our uh, corporate pages. Um, but in terms of outbound, we did um, a lot of education events, in-person webcasts, and that later grew into a conference. But the conference, we can talk about that later, was mostly for customers. Um, and the events where, especially we grew a program that initially um, tested in three markets where for simply for three hours, we get people in a larger meeting room up to anywhere between 30 to 120. We'd organize a panel with our most innovative customers, those who had been experimenting, innovating with LinkedIn, would just share how they were using social media in general to recruit. Turns out it was mostly around LinkedIn, of course. And then we invited people to come to those webcasts or in person simply because we had the email addresses and the contacts on LinkedIn. And they were just listening to the most innovative and progressive customers. And at some point they wanted to know, well, of course, people were talking about how they were using LinkedIn for more strategic recruiting, because that's exactly who we selected. Uh, and then we went into a product demo. And so the outbound was working. So that outbound was working so well. We, after I started with uh, three of those uh, meetings, we ended up running 130 a year in the world uh, of that. And same thing in webcast. And then, of course, all the right content emails we we come up and wrote recruiting trends uh initially for the us and then took that to many countries and that was more content webcast etc so it was a lot of a classic dimension type of and content based outbound based on education but i think what's super interesting what you're saying there is you sort of use the voice of the customer and understood okay how are they using linkedin really successfully and then mirrored that back to other recruiters to say hey look you know this recruiter is using linkedin really well you should you should use it in this way too, and that and that sort of compounded over time. And then you obviously had the added benefit of an amazing brand and the network effects that you could do to kind of recruit recruit more people. Big, big, big time. So where especially, and this is where having a sales team in multiple regions helped because they were building those relationships and we were tapping them big time as a as a marketing team. Hey, who in your region is strategic? Who should we know? What do they do right? And this is why also we we started some customer advisory boards with them, but. The, the beauty, we, I didn't realize it at the time, of doing these city-based events and every time just sweating through who do we invite uh, and those that were sharing the right stories, they didn't have to be stories about LinkedIn, but strategic recruiting. We made sure we're staying very close to them, thanking them, sending them gifts, keeping them in, the, in our uh, ecosystem. And then they upgraded later to also become the keynote speakers, the webcast speakers, our ambassadors, et cetera. That was essential. No, it's, it's amazing. It reminds me of what I did a little bit at, at Lattice, thanks to your help with like the resources for humans stuff. No, it's it's a really and, powerful and, playbook of just this like kind of grassroots, you know, from from you know from events and and community organizing things, and then showing that all back to to the customers and kind of your next uh, uh, you know the next next round of buyers, if you will. You, you mentioned it a little bit briefly, like this the LinkedIn Talent Connect Conference. I'd love to know kind of how that came to be and, and why you created such a, an awesome conference for recruiters. Yeah, um, so there were already a few conferences and many conferences for uh, recruiters, and they were done by third-party organizations who had to make money from that and therefore invited a lot of vendors. 
but the, the real reason we created one is at some point we realized, okay, so now that we've got a good acquisition uh, machine, we also need to do a lot more to upsell, cross-sell, and further engage the customers. So one of the great ways to do that is why don't we think about doing a conference so that we can put them more in touch with the most innovative ones, spend more time, have the account manager spend more time with them, um, and really push the profession forward. So that's why we started. And by the way, it wasn't an open conference. The confer conference was by invite only initially. So it drove that feeling of exclusivity. I was very lucky to be able to have decent budgets. So there were no vendors. There was no uh, exhibit floor. And it was all about celebrating the journey and all the improvements of the profession and being there as their strategic partner. Uh, and of course, we also invited prospects, handpicked. So um, the, there were clear rules that the AEs could invite them. And we invited also, uh, of course, a lot of influencers as well. Uh, but it was all about sharing best practices, uh, of course, uh, keynotes by LinkedIn. Uh, and a lot of our ideally smart, smartest people just crunching some data and playing back some best practices, helping this this profession become more data driven and more strategic. And then another similar initiative, I guess, you know, maybe more at a, at a, for a VIP level was like the customer advisory board. And I think that was hugely influential. I know you've talked to, is that, was that the LinkedIn 100? Is that what you called the customer advisory board or was that something else? Uh, the LinkedIn, uh, the LinkedIn 100 was uh, later. It was a, a, a best off or at least okay. grouping a few customer advisory boards. But yeah, I started the customer advisory boards probably two or three months into my tenure because I wanted to get to know more customers, feed everything we're doing with voice of customer, expose the product team, the product marketing team, uh, and, and each other to what they were thinking. That's something I got from my days at Yahoo, which is also a best practice we got there through hiring people from eBay who are exceptionally good at community management with these sorts of uh, customer advisory boards. But the, the, the benefits... I didn't see them necessarily at the time is, first of all, it's amazing motivation for the team. You build relationships with customers. They, they don't end up being anonymous, like I don't know them entities. They're real people. You become friends with them. You spend time. You understand what they're dealing with. Uh, you, it becomes a great source of content. It becomes an amazing source of listening to the same insights together as an extended team. When product, product marketing, marketing, and sales hear the same nuggets of insights from customers, it really sends us to into the same direction. Usually, everybody brings their own lens and the, their own facet to building that that castle together. Um, but it does it in a way that you want to solve somebody's problem. Uh, and then next, also, it creates amazing ambassadors from the customers. For instance, um, we had the head of recruiting at Adobe who was there, and we realized through this discussion, massive champion of LinkedIn, but also. And at the time, Facebook was a big threat potentially for us. And it was really against using Facebook to recruit. So much so that one day we get a ping from a journalist saying, hey, we hear we're, Facebook is about to launch some recruiting solutions. I'm going to write about it. Okay. I know that Jeff over there at Adobe feels strongly about that. Do you want to talk to him? He turned around the story. And the story ended up being instead of positive about Facebook getting in the space, it was negative. And that could never have happened if we didn't had not spent hours with this head of uh, talent acquisition and getting to know what he cared about and what he was passionate about. Uh, so later, after three years of doing that, and for plus all the great speakers we had in our uh, speaking circuit, we thought, why don't we create a super group, LinkedIn, LinkedIn 100, of the most progressive, innovative, forward-thinking customers. And we brought all of them together in this program called LinkedIn 100. And we told three of them that, uh, asked three of them if they would be co-chairs, but basically we give them access to resources, our time, so that they could organize the forum by themselves, define the agenda, and they, they loved it. They had the sub -con their conference within the conference, their own groups, and they were the most innovative, uh, basically, talent acquisition leaders. Yeah, it's super interesting to hear you talk about just how close you were to customers. Because that's always like the early stage uh, you know, advice is like founders need to be really close to customers, do founder-led sales. But like LinkedIn was able to maintain that at like pretty significant scale through like these different programs, whether it was the LinkedIn 100, the CAB, the, the conference. And it's like an amazing sort of playbook for other companies to to run as well, where you can kind of have these, these structured voice of the customer events. And then that kind of just makes the whole business better, whether it's the product and sales stuff. It's really, really cool to hear you talk about. And, and so LinkedIn is like this giant marketplace of talent. And there's obviously like a very careful 
balance to monetizing these marketplaces, right? If you if you yeah. monetize too aggressively, you might upset like your greatest asset, which is like the talent on the platform and the people, all these recruiters want to hit up. And so how did you think about that balance at, at LinkedIn? Uh, so Reed Huffman and the founders thought about it from the beginning. So that's why the first value we had was members first. It was the recognition they will not be a healthy ecosystem if there are not a lot of free and engaged members. And that becomes such an ingrained value that we wouldn't even start the, the pitches to ve- the um, executive briefing. So when we're talking to like very large customers and tell them member first is our first and primary value. There's no amount that you can pay us, no check big enough that will make us forget that. And here's why. And we were doing this on purpose so they would understand all the things we wouldn't do for them because they understood that for them to benefit long-term from the ecosystem, we couldn't compromise on, we wouldn't sell our uh, users' data. Uh, we wouldn't do things that would damage engagement. Um, and of course, there was always a tension with the emails and things like that because the more you receive, the more you could be considered spammy. Um, so we, we were thinking of ways to incentivize sending good emails, training people on how to do that. Maybe they, they could renew the emails if their emails were replied or accepted. So we kept tweaking and iterating with that. That was, you're right, super essential. And it makes sense. That's why I can't go on LinkedIn and just export all of the emails from a bunch of prospects, right? I need to go through these like really focused product experiences. And, you know, it obviously worked out, worked out really well. Um, you know, so during your time at LinkedIn, you grew the marketing team pretty significantly. I think it grew from like two to 50 plus people. Um, I'd love to know, like, what was that experience like for you? Because I don't think you had ever done something like that before. No, yeah. The, the largest team I was managing before that was, I think, four people. Uh, so first, w- when you join a rocket ship and you know you're going to have the luxury to hire a lot of people, uh, the first thing I did is I need to, especially I was marketing into recruiting. I need to teach. I need to learn how to recruit well. And so I spent quite a bit of time and I recommend a book called um, Who? The A Method for Hiring. Um, and I spent an inordinate amount of time just going religiously through a a process, not skipping steps from scoping the role to reference checks to onboarding and making sure that every hire I was making was going to be the right one to go and learn fast and do something that we had not been done before. So quick learners, people who were as much as possible, I was tapping my connections to make sure that there was a culture fit and someone who came highly recommended. Uh, I made a few bets on people who had not had ever any product marketing experience because I knew they were strategic, they could write well, and they could especially learn really fast. Um, and so over-invested in that, taught my team to also over-invest in that. Um, then I was already using OKRs at Yahoo, and I kept doing that, and that really helped a lot. And of course, adjusting the, the level that you manage the team uh, in there from the people who need quite a bit of coaching to those who don't. But in general, the moment I could pick up that someone could be autonomous, I was giving them as much autonomy as possible. Um, and then there was a, a fantastic sales culture and leadership at LinkedIn had, uh, led by Mike Gamson. That was super customer first, very positive in the thinking, focused on growth. And I got my team also close to that. And I drafted from that great uh, leader to just learn from him how he was scaling his team, thinking about that, inspiring people. And also used a lot of that magic that happens when you connect with the customers and exposing my team to that. Come to the cab, listen in, uh, get to know them. And, and that really creates some common fuel to that we will operate from. Were there any really tough moments along the way in, in building LinkedIn? Any, yeah, any, any kind of hard moments that stand out to you? Yeah, well, for, for me especially, there was a, always a tension between the self-serve business and the sales-led. Um, and, and namely, the, the main problem was that our reps were very successful selling even SMBs up to $10,000 a year for something they could have bought for maybe a third of the price online. And so the reps, as a result, were really fishing in the segments that were meant to be self-service. And that created a lot of tension internally, especially if you can imagine if you're the product manager in charge of the self-service business and you see your revenue cannibalized a little bit by the salespeople who could create then opportunities for churn later because the customers are looking like, well, do I really need all this? 
Um, and and th that led to really difficult conversations and adjustments uh, in terms of team organization, budgets, do not touch targets and how to handle that. Um, did you have any other ones in mind that I may have shared with you before? Yeah. There was there any tough moments with Jeff Weider? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Okay. Um, that was more a moment after the, the conference, um, after the first or the second one, I forget. Massive success. Everybody's super excited. The company is the first time LinkedIn had done a conference. And, and you know, recruiting was an underserved function. So it was great to make them come together and celebrate them. So I think in my, I'm in my um, manager's office, Patrick Crane, fantastic CMO who hired me there. And he was my boss also at Yahoo. And Jeff barges in and goes, oh, so, so happy for this conference. This is great. We've decided next year you're going to be in charge, and we're going to do one that brings together all our uh, business lines together. So we're going to have we're going to bring marketing for advertising, we're going to bring recruiting, and we're going to bring sales. And before I had time to articulate my thoughts fully, I said, "Great, but I won't be doing that. I don't think I'll be here anymore." And I thought, "Oh my God, what a need. I'm I'm going to get fired." They looked at me in such disbelief that they didn't say anything for a while, and I had time to say, "Here's why," because this is about them. If we, if we make it about our three business lines, the common denominator is going to be LinkedIn. So we'll become a, a conference about us. The Talent Connect worked because we celebrated them and where they're going as a profession, how they're taking it to, taking it to the next level. We cannot lose that. This is so, you, you felt the energy. They were so excited. There was a vendor standing for them. And, and they looked at it, oh, makes sense. And then Indeed, we were able to continue talent connect and keep it pure. But I, I was really scared of the way they looked back at me. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I think I'm out. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Like you always want to focus on one persona and have that persona be the champion. And as soon as you start combining a lot of different personas, it sort of muddies your message. Yeah, um, exactly. And there's moments where I've been to, and I think they do a fantastic job, but you go to Dreamforce and it's, it's more about Salesforce and I... Customers in general, they're really good at customer marketing, but it doesn't feel it's got that one identity of the, the people they champion. And I wanted to really preserve that. So I'd love to switch gears a little bit away from LinkedIn, because since LinkedIn, you've, you've spent a lot of your career working in developer marketing. You know, you started as being like the CMO of Twilio, and then you went on to held interim CMO positions at Algolio, Apollo, GraphQL, Versal, and more. I'd love to know what makes developer, developer marketing different from marketing to other audiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, correction. I wasn't a uh, CMO. Or you're the VP of Global Marketing. Right? I was an advisor. Uh, it's, a, it's a great company and they really get front end devs uh, beautifully. Um, and, and before that, I was also the head of marketing for VP marketing for Udacity, where aspiring developers were coming to us. So, I had the chance also to see what it takes to become one. And developer marketing is, I'm tempted to say it's the same thing, but more. More. You need to be more authentic. You need to be more focused on education. You need to be precise in, in the claims you make. You need to avoid buzzwords. You just need to help educate. Basically, the, the main difference is uh, developers need focus time to work. They, need, they, they are used to learning on their own very often, finding resources, reading docs, trying uh, to build things. They have to learn so much all the time because tech changes so fast. And they spend a lot of time also debugging and, and trying to solve, both be creative and also just fix problems. So the moment you understand that this is all about making them uh, efficient in learning, efficient in building, and efficient in fixing, that changes how you, you think about things. So for instance, don't write jargon. Understand that the developer, if they look at your web page and they see buzzwords and jargon, they go straight to the docs. Why? Because that's where there's plain English to them. What your product is, is explained in, in simple words. I work is explained there as well. So why don't you bring that ethos uh, into your copy, email, website, et cetera? Uh, they, when they debug, they spend time sometimes looking for a comma or a, a period that's in the wrong place. And so that means also everything you write needs to be right on. And you need to show a lot of empathy. That means understand how they work, how they learn, what they're trying to do. And the moment you, do, you get that right, um, then it works. But, but you, these principles can be completely applied to the rest of marketing. Don't treat your customers as they're, they're smart because they are. They're creative. They're trying to problem solve. They want you to be authentic. You, they don't want you to just tell them, hey, it's going to be the best outcome possible when you use this. No, describe functionally what it does and how it works. 
and, and keep the the big claims to a minimum. Because when I tested some very big organizational or benefit oriented claims on the web page on the website of Twilio, they if you're lucky they don't read them. If you're unlucky, they start tweet, tweeting about it and bad mathing you. But then they exit out to dogs. And I think one of the things Twilio was really good at was like developer evangelism. Like you can't drive down the 101 in San Francisco without seeing like the ask your developer billboards. And I'm curious like how you thought about, yeah, like because you, you described like education and, and speaking plain English, but how did you turn these developers into evangelists and make them just like super excited? Was it making them kind of the hero in the organization or how did you, how did you think about that at Twilio? We were making them the heroes but when we were talking to another audience, we were always treating, and Jeff Lawson was you know, the founder who said, yes, I can build a business that's going to be targeted for developers and where the developers will be the ones adopting the product and paying. People have, have used to say developers have no influence. They got no budget. You cannot build a, a business on them and you prove the people wrong. Billboards were not targeted developers. So you asked me as we were preparing for this call, like, what campaigns, for instance, did you do to engage developers? Turns out I couldn't really think of one because campaigns are too gimmicky for them. What we did instead is a bunch of ongoing, call it evergreen education from what we call stories with code, which is how to tutorials, how do you create a text alert for uh, appointment reminders, for instance, in Python, et cetera. So basically, let's be where they are learning. So either they're Googling something, how do I do this? I'm stuck. Or there are a conference or hackathon trying to build a you know, hack something as a team. And we were sponsoring a lot of that because we wanted access to giving them a five minute demo, being there to support them, uh, showing, and by the way, we're sweating the, the details of the five minute demo to get it absolutely right, to tell a story. Um, so a bunch of educational things. Um, so in the end, the billboard was really there. We kept it for, to, to show to decision makers and buyers. Uh, to, to force a dialogue, to position the developers as heroes um, and for talent brand purposes. Um, and, and yes, it, it really helped the ethos of there's a brand out there, developers that champions you, who are the first probably to show some code on the um, on the front of the New York Stock Exchange when, when, when we IPO'd and also doing live demos on, state, on, um, on the floor uh, and, and live streaming that. Uh, to really show the new influence and the power of developers and being creative and solving business problems. And when you were at Twilio, I think you grew revenue from like 165 million to 400 million plus, and, and the company went went public during your time. And yeah. I believe during this time, um, the company also went from like pure PLG to adding more of like an enterprise sales motion. I'd love to kind of understand what that process was like. How did you help the company transition to to that new world? Yeah, so that, that's one of the reasons they, they hired me because they liked my experience at LinkedIn and in doing mid-market enterprise marketing. But on top of a very strong PLG you know, consumer type uh, motion, which Twilio was really good at. So we had fantastic, and Tw uh, Twilio was designed for that, developer self-serve experience. So the, the first thing was going through, and today we called it from PLG to more PLS. So from self-serve to really identifying and grooming the right developers, the right accounts that were showing promise, either because of their engagement or their profile, and making sure that the human assistance, product-led sales, was right. So we failed at sending a lead or a sign-up to an AE. That wouldn't work. But what worked is having a team in the middle that we call technical BDRs. So people early in their careers really understood how to help a developer on the way. Hey, can I help you get unstuck? Can I send you the right docs? Can I offer you the right discount to extend your trial or um, show you to other resources that get you unstuck? And then through that, helping figure out, okay, is there really an opportunity there? Then can I pass on to an AE? So what we added was really a product-led sales motion first to that great PLG and self serve adoption model. Uh, number two is when when you go and try to really add this outbound or enterprise or sales-led motion, we had to do it via use cases. On the developer side, to go back to your former question, the, the main strategy was to put Twilio in the toolkit of every developer, even before they have a real use case with volume and budget. 
So that means ongoing education, believe that is we're playing a long-term game. An enterprise will engage with you and only spend time if they have a real need, which usually is a use case. So that means we, we turned and created marketing that was use case centric. It wasn't about all the products and the API bricks, but it was about, oh, you can do text and alerts. You can do call center. You can go call tracking. You can do two-factor authentication. And then creating mini teams uh, that were bringing together some people in product marketing, some people in demand gen, some people in sales to go and approach that as almost startups um, and doing a more traditional demand gen play. Uh, and the third aspect was a lot of sales in the moment because it's a technical product. Uh, you need to explain it to decision makers who are not necessarily familiar with, well, this is how you think and use APIs, creating case studies for all these also use cases and ongoing and ongoing uh, sales enablement and education that was really key so that they could in turn just educate also the economic buyers. Yeah, it's really interesting how sales just became an extension of this general like education strategy. And I love this idea of like the technical BDRs who are coming in, not just, you know, their goal is not just to sell, but actually to help them just get more value and use the product more, which, you know, obviously will eventually lead to a sale. It's a very, I don't know, good, good way to sort of, uh, you know, uh, get a developer over the line and actually lead to those those juicy enterprise deals. Uh, yeah, and that's super critical and something I've seen also at MongoDB does that. So the, the sales team that handles the pro for product-led sales basically is super helpful, is quite technical. Uh, same thing, Vercel did the same thing with product advocates that were technically embedded in marketing, so close to the content created by developer relations and really there to a quid pro quo. I'm going to help you. In the process, I'm going to find some information about you, your use case, um, maybe your budget, who else you'd like us to talk to in the organization to give you the license and the freedom to use our service more if you're interested. And then position the next conversation with potentially a sales engineer or introduce the AE as the ally who can really help you make the case for you know, spending more money on this if you really like the tool uh, by approaching together the decision makers, because developers typically hate just having to just make these business cases and work with procurement and, and buyers internally. Yeah. So the AE did all like the annoy the annoying work for the developers. Yeah. That's really it's interesting to hear. Um so I've never been a comp part of a company who went public. I know as part of this process, like there's a lot of pressure to kind of get the house in order when it comes to, you know, predictably forecasting revenue, but I'm sure there's a lot more. Um, you know, what's marketing's role as the companies go public? How did you think about that challenge at Twilio? Yeah. Um, so when I joined, literally three months later, we're starting the process. So I wasn't really part of all the engine that was making everything more predictable, helping with forecasts, et cetera. So uh, maybe three phases of helping with the IPO. The first is you need to help tell the story. It's a big product marketing and case study exercise for the S1, the way that the, the products and the show on the website for investors helping with the roadshow. The longest poll uh, thing was really coming up with great case studies, stories, and videos from customers who can, and the great brands who would explain what Twilio was. because That wasn't easy for others to understand uh, and what they were doing with it. Uh, number two, the day off I say, is, is something that I think people just, at least for us, we made it a big deal because that was, as I explain, explained earlier, a moment to really celebrate developers at Wall Street, in Wall Street and live coding from uh, the, tra the trading floor, uh, the, um, the billboards and, and going there even with an API flag uh, and waving the API flag uh, at Wall Street was pretty cool. And then after we also got ready to, the moment you get out of your um, like period where you can't really do any comms, uh, is securing a, we managed to secure a, a Forbes uh, cover story that was showcasing Jeff Lawson. And so that the comms team had been really hard at work for that. And by the way, also the day of, there's a lot of comms and interview prep that needs to take place, which is very difficult for a founder because they go from pitching investors and they are allowed to disclose and they have to disclose, or at least tell the exact same pitch all the time to all of a sudden you're talking to journalists, vastly different. So helping uh, Jeff do that uh, was also a big uh, amount of work for the comms team. I'd love to switch gears to when we first started working together. So yeah, you were my marketing coach at Lattice and we met as I was trying to scale myself and, you know, sort of move from just, you know, the first marketer at Lattice to, to a VP of marketing. And, and you really were amazing and really helped me become a better marketer 
um, but also probably more importantly helps me learn how to like be an executive at a company. Um, and I know you did this not just for me, but you had you know you're coaching a lot of other uh, you know aspiring marketers at, at the time. And so I'm curious, like what common challenges you see marketers face as they grow their careers? Are there are there certain patterns that 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 emerge as people try and move from kind of you know a solo marketer to a director and VP and, and beyond? Uh, yeah, a few. Uh, but first, I want to call you out for, I mean, everything was in you and it was such a pleasure to work with you. And thank you for the, the kind words. It, it, it was really a privilege to see you grow. And I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give examples of how you've done it. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> because first you were an incredibly high performing, fast producing IC who also had created or started enlisting a, a really strong team. Uh, and then, so the, the next thing to understand is I cannot do everything anymore. I need to hire people who are better than me at their craft. So segmenting, you are doing everything. And all of a sudden, you need to create a product marketing function. You need to create a content function. You need to create a comms function, field marketing, growth, etc. In your case, um, and to anybody I'd recommend, we'll also understand, is there anything of that you want to hold out and keep to yourself because you love doing it. In your case, you love doing multi-channel integrated campaign, brand work, website work. That part you kept. So what is that you love doing? And it's going to be very difficult finding someone who's better than you at that. And what are the other things that you need to hire for? And then spend time initially up front understanding what is the job of a product marketer? Interview a few without actually interview. Actually, I mean, by that, I mean benchmark. Uh, understand what the role is about, but mostly what each role will be about at your company. Because product marketing at company A could be vastly different from product marketing at company B. Uh, same thing, what type of growth leader demand gen. So really think about that and understand each role, understand who you're trying to hire. Never hesitate, and this is what you did, to hire people who, who seem more impressive than you and you're going to learn from. Think of every hire as a gift to the company, to your team, and to yourself, because they're going to push you to become better. I've seen some people just shy away from hiring people who are better than them because they, they thought, hey, they're going to take my role. Great. Your boss wants you to have a section, succession plan. Just build a succession plan. So you went from, and then you more and more you communicate about your vision, the key priorities, repeat them again and again, remove blockers for your team instead of doing st stuff for them, Allow them to try stuff and sometimes fail. Um, and then urge the need, the reflex that someone like you may have had because you knew how to fix something in five minutes. They didn't. Give them pointers, but let them do it. And then take stock on a regular basis. Where do you stand? How am I doing there? Um, the fact that we were uh, working together was, I think, also helpful because it allowed you to stop and think like, and get challenged by somebody else. Like, why did you do this? Or is that okay that you don't touch this anymore? And do they need any guidance? And wh where you are exceptional is you remove blockers for them all the time. Um, and you show them also this culture of moving fast and trying things. And that even when you were managing a large team, you were still getting your hands dirty. And that also, also set the tone. And I think you were so helpful in just making sure like I was on the right track and not going crazy because I was just learning so much on my own. But I I never actually worked at a SaaS marketing you know program before. So I didn't know actually what good looked like. And so you were like such a helpful barometer in, you know, understanding, oh, I am on the right track, or oh, this problem is really common. Like one one thing that comes to mind was like the email list, right? We were all fighting over, you know, how many emails we can send out. Demand gen wants to send emails, events wants to send emails, content wants to send emails. And I remember you saying to me like that's just the problem that marketing teams have like at yahoo right i think there was like you know a very clear process to like get an yeah. email out the door right and like little tactical things were so helpful and just me being like oh this is just what a scaled marketing program looks like so yeah thank and you. you're bringing a great point like basically we there's a few things as a marketing leader you need to do exceptionally well and in different way but most of the other things are very similar and people face the same thing so surround yourself with friends, network, join communities that face the same challenges because you'll learn so so fast and so much. Um, and especially now, there's so much content and communities everywhere. It, it'd be a crime not to do it. And, and then, you know, ask your, in, in this case, when we worked together, it was because Jack, CEO and, and founder and co-founder, you know, believed in you. 
So you said, you know, I've got someone who's crazy high potential, hasn't seen the movie before. Can you help? But everybody deserves a, a buddy like that. Um, whether you pay them or not, it's, it's really essential to find your support system. Uh, other advice for marketers in tech, especially. A lot of them get too quickly disconnected from product and especially customers. And I'm going back to the points I was making at LinkedIn before. Customer proximity is your magic potion. You lose that, you can become irrelevant pretty quickly, or you become someone who creates programs, uh, runs programs, look at budgets, and we need some people like that. But as the head of marketing for a company, you are serving a CEO, typically, that has amazing intuition and understanding of the customer. They expect you to also understand the customers and the market. If you want to build a great relationship with product, you need to infuse that knowledge of the competitive environment, the market, the customers. If you want to build a great relationship with sales, you, of course, need to serve uh, them with qualified leads enablement, which also starts with expertise of market and customers. And that is one thing that if we don't prioritize it, it falls to the cracks. But these days, staying in touch with customers can be as easy as listening to three gun calls a week. Uh, but I deal also just building relationships with customers so that they keep educating you. Uh, that's the, the one thing that I see. A lot, I hear a lot of CEOs complain about the head of marketing. Yeah. And that's something I definitely thought I was doing at Lattice, but in retrospect, I was not doing enough. Like at Doc now, I am so deeply invested with, with customer relationships, managing support, getting on calls, talking to people. Like I just really understand that problem. And I was not getting on calls enough with like H the HR folks we were selling uh, at Lattice. And, the, you know, in retrospect, uh, you know, I probably could have could have done an even better job if I had done that. Um, one uh, other th same thing for me. I, I tell you, I should have done that also a lot more. I was doing it every week at Udacity, talking to student a week. I was doing it quite a bit at LinkedIn, arguably never enough. Uh, but you look at a, a CEO, for instance, will probably spend after even they've got an established sales team, hopefully anywhere between 20, 10 and 20% of their time with customers. And in marketing, if you don't understand them, you go nowhere. So yeah, and it's one of great the motivation. And one of the big transitions for me was kind of be, you know, once you're a VP, right, your, your, your sort of first team becomes the exec team um, and working with all of these different functional leaders, right? And you obviously still have to manage the marketing team, but you have to work with, you know, sales and product and the CEO and, and that group. And then you also have to work with, with the board and, and kind of manage, manage that relationship. Do you have any advice for, for marketers who are kind of just becoming a VP on, on how they can manage either, you know, both the exec relationships and, and kind of the board side of things? Uh, yeah, sure. The, the first thing is, I'm, I'm going back to, if you know the customers already, that gives you a wonderful set of insights to bring and contribute. Two, and I remember we we're talking about that, imagine the analogy of you're at the center of your team initially, you're doing a lot of things, you're uh, coordinating all, all the trains, et cetera, but get yourself out of there to operate at the periphery, which gives you more bandwidth to spend time with the relationships. So it means hiring right, having clear roles and responsibilities, OKRs, and letting your team operate as autonomously as they can. Then uh, build clear expectations with your peers. By that, have sales, product, et cetera. I did that wrong at LinkedIn for a long time, where I was negotiating almost expectations with them one by one, and my priorities with them one by one. And they, of course, they had different priorities and different agendas. So what I learned and what my advice would be, make sure that the expectations are discussed in public with the constituents. So they hear the trade-offs you're dealing with. You put together, you put forth that recommendation, and then you discuss it as a team. CEO, head of product, head of sales, you, and maybe your top lieutenants together. And you come up with a list that's published and clear. These are the things that marketing is supposed to do first. Here's how it's staffed. Here are the things below the line. And then you can validate with the board, socialize with the board, not validate. Um, but until you got this alignment, because marketing could be doing so many different things, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, and then there's ways to address the relationships with each, each uh, function, if you want to get into that product sales, et cetera. Uh, but these are the initial requirements. Yeah, I still actually remember doing that exercise with you. We had like a big whiteboard and it was me, you, Jack and Jayzak in a room and I like listed out all of the marketing things and we we listed out like the top five priorities and what fell below the line. And and it really just helped me communicate to Jack and Jayzak. It was like, hey, here's all the stuff 
I am doing. Each of these have, you know, needs to be staffed in a certain way, have different, you know, uh, impacts on on the, on the business and just having a, a, a framework and a way to talk with the other execs of the company about it was so helpful and giving, giving them a sense of too of like why I was making decisions and why I was maybe deprioritizing outbound over SEO and things, things like that. So yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pleasure. It's the template is crazy basic, but it's the exercise of doing that together. Example, Algolia. The head of product wanted in the top three of marketing to see product launches. Of course, right? He, his team creates product. He wants to launch them in the right way and drive massive adoption right away. But they hired me as a fractional CMO to build up their enterprise marketing motion. And the CEO was super clear about that. We're all in the room and the head of product hears that firsthand from the CEO. And then you go, oh, okay, I understand. So now the, the exercise for him becomes, how do I do that on my own with my team? And can marketing support give me the tool instead of the actual bandwidth? Um, and that magic line row of below the line for now is so helpful. I'd love to end our conversation on kind of a, a fun and, and maybe timely note. You know, everyone is talking about AI right now. AI startups are getting funded like crazy and everyone's trying to figure out how to best kind of incorporate AI into their companies. I think you'd probably have an interesting perspective. Like, how do you think AI is going to impact marketing? Any any guesses on, on the future? Well, yeah, we're each going to get our, and you've seen every day, new co-pilots launching. So we're each going to get are co-pilots or multiple co-pilots for our different activities. Um, for instance, for product marketing, there's so much you can do with, if only using ChatGPT, and by the way, at 20 bucks a month, it's well <laughs> paying for the, the premium version. Uh, but in terms of research, understanding the persona, what they care about, the pain points you deal with, uh, they deal with the creating persona cards, um, riffing on messaging, Riffing on headlines. I even was able by pushing it, create a really wonderful billboard uh, concept uh, for different campaigns. And just that in 30 minutes or, or less, if you really iterate and push it and give it a clear brief and push back when you see something you don't like. So product marketers have this assistant right there, uh, but then you can also use that for growth. Um, you can actually have it do, uh, of course, content creation, assisting. I, I don't recommend just pushing anything with that supervision. So it's still original and a bit unique. Um, but campaigns, banners, landing pages, all that stuff. So it's really augmenting and accelerating us big, big time. Um, starting with research, just understanding if you're a product marketer, you need to understand your different segments and your competitors. You, you can ask if you answer the right questions, how, why? What's growing, why, et cetera, just get accelerated so in a way that I never thought was possible so fast. Well, thank you so much for the for the wonderful. What are you gonna say? Yeah, what have you seen? <laughs> what have I seen? So yeah. we've we've we actually played around with it for this podcast. Like we actually, I'm pretty sure Grow and Tell the name. I think it came out of a brainstorm with Chat GPT, where you know Eric was our producer was going back and forth with 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 Chat GPT and trying to come up with different names and and, and subheaders and things like that. So that's one way is like just creative ide ideation. Um, we're also experimenting with on the content side of things because we we're investing a lot into SEO. So it's like. What's this balance between like AI generated SEO content versus stuff written by humans? And it's not quite perfect. You know, it's not quite like does all of the job, but it definitely augments our jobs right now. And yeah, I don't know. I need to play around with it more, but those have been like two ways we've experimented with it at Doc. Here's a way that if, you, if you're okay in the last minute uh, has been very helpful in terms of prompt. If you find a framework or an article or blog post you really like online, you feed that to ChatGPT and you say, using the frameworks, I would like you to uh, like apply that to, and you describe the target audience you have, the product category, et cetera, uh, and basically speed out a recommendation along these lines. And so if you find a, a blog post or a grid framework for almost everything you want to do, you can actually marry your own context with that framework and be very, very specific in the way you want it to format the output. No, it's crazy. Yeah. And we're trying to think through how we build it and to dock the product. And I don't, you know, we haven't quite figured out, you know, we're not going to pivot the whole company to AI, but I think, you know, there are some really interesting features and things we can, we can add to just augment the way sales teams, customer onboarding and all that, that stuff works. So yeah, I don't know. It's an exciting time uh, to be in tech to say, you know, even though there's, you know, a little economic downturn, but uh, AI is definitely going to be an interesting headwind for all of us. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, 
Well, thank you so much for the wonderful conversation, Francois. If people want to find you, where should they follow up? Uh, LinkedIn's the best. Uh, find me there. Uh, you can follow me there and see the articles I publish. I write on PLG. I write on positioning and category creation. And also, uh, I, I publish quite a lot on uh, decibel.vc if you want to see some best practices for uh, everything that has to do with uh, B2B, well, uh, B2B software marketing. Sweet. Thank you, Francois. Thanks, Alex, for having me. It was a pleasure to reconnect with you. And uh, let us uh, I, I hope people will find some value in this. Take care. That's a wrap on another episode of Grow & Tell. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, or find every episode at growandtellshow.com. I'm your host, Alex Krakov. Thank you for listening.